Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for coming to this event. Uh, this event, I don't know what the formal title of the event is. I don't have it in front of me, but it's why randomized control trials are sexy, exciting, and important. <laughs> That's my title for the event from now on. Uh, if you are on social media, uh, please follow along, take photographs, uh, issue uh, laudatory or rude remarks about what's being said using the hashtag randomistas, which is the title of the book we're going to be discussing today. Thank you to all of those who are here in the room, especially at this time of year. appreciate you turning up. Thank you to those who are also watching online. We are webcasting this live, and so thank you to those of you who are watching there. In fact, thank you almost as much to you watching online as to those who are here, because after all, you actually came, whereas half of them are still in their pajamas drinking coffee. We actually have, looking at the people who've signed up for the webcast, anyway, we have some people who are watching from Australia, uh, and that will become clear to you in a moment why, because our guest speaker is from Australia. Uh, I can't tell you exactly how many are watching from Australia, but hello, it's the middle of the night in Australia right now. So that group of people who are watching from Australia form into two very discrete groups. One, the people who genuinely think that randomized control trials are sexy, interesting, and important, and that is an important group. And secondly, political journalists who are hoping you say something that will be newsworthy <laughs> on the assumption that no one's going to notice because you're on the other side of the world. So I encourage you to say something really inflammatory to reward those humble journalists who are staying up all night in Australia to hear from you. So my name is Richard Reeves. I'm a senior fellow here in economic studies. I run a project on the future of the middle class, and I co-direct the Center on Children and Families. The other co-director is Ron Haskins uh, of the Center on Children and Families, and his own work is very closely related to the work we're going to be discussing today. Um, he is the author of a number of books and articles on evidence-based policy. He was co-chair of the Congressional Commission on Evidence-Based Policy, and the only reason he's not with us today is because he actually had realized after we'd organized the event that he had a vacation long planned with his wife, which is where Ron is now. And although I think he was tempted to run his own trial to see what would happen if he attempted to cancel this long planned uh, <laughs> event with his wife, he was dissuaded from that course of action. So uh, I am here in his stead, but I know that Ron uh, would definitely want to be here if he could and how important he sees the event. And it is Ron's initiative that uh, I think that helped to bring uh, Andrew here. So I'm going to introduce our guest speaker. Then we'll have a panel. I won't introduce our panelists yet. I'll introduce them when we come to the panel. Um, but I'm going to introduce the Honourable Andrew Lee, MP. As I've already indicated, he's from Australia. He has been a member of the Australian Labour Party since 1991. He's now the Shadow Assistant Treasurer. Um, before he was elected in 2010, he was Professor of Economics at the Australian National University. He has a PhD in public policy from Harvard, and he graduated from the University of Sydney with a first class in law and the arts. He's also a past recipient of the Young Economist Award, an award that's given every two years by the Economic Society of Australia to the best Australian economist under the age of 40. Further proof, if we needed it, that being young is not the same thing as being a young economist. It's all relative, you see. He's written a number of books, including Disconnected, Battlers and Billionaires, and so on. But his latest book, which he's going to be talking to us uh, in just a moment, is the one that I gave you the hashtag for earlier, Randomistas, How Radical Researchers Are Changing Our World. And if I tell you that it's a book about the, importance of ra the history and importance of randomized control trials, which is also a really sparkling read, then the only way to prove me wrong will be to buy it for yourself. Um, but it really is very good. And one of the things that I think Andrew does very well is to just, in a very straightforward way, explain why the stakes are so high, and not least around causality and correlation. So everybody that's done any basic statistics knows the old mantra, correlation is not the same as causality, etc. But he brings that to life in this following way. Misleading correlations are all around us. Ice cream sales are correlated with shark attacks but that doesn't mean you should boycott Mr. Whippy. Shoe size is correlated with exam performance, but buying adult shoes for kindergartners isn't going to help. And countries with higher chocolate consumption win more Nobel Prizes, but chomping Cadbury won't make you a genius. That's just one example of the way that I think um, Andrew really does bring this story to life. Um, so he's going to speak about his book for about 20 minutes, uh, and then we're going to have some responses from really just a stellar panel, and then we'll have the chance to have a quick discussion among the panel before opening up to the floor. So with that, please join me in welcoming the, Andrew, uh, the Honourable Andrew Lee MP. Andrew, please come. All 
Well, thank you, Richard, for a uh, wonderfully sparkling introduction there. And uh, it's a real honour to be here at uh, Brookings, uh, what I regard as the world's greatest think tank, uh, to launch the Yale University Press edition of Random Esters. Um, can I start, of course, by acknowledging uh, Ron Haskins, as uh, Richard did, uh, without whom this event wouldn't be happening today, uh, and John Barron and the Laura and John Arnold Foundation uh, for their support of today's event. Uh, I'd also, of course, thank uh, Richard Reeves uh, and the other two panellists, uh, Thomas Cook and Rebecca Maynard, uh, as well as the organiser, Anna Dawson. Uh, I'd especially like to uh, thank the attendees who are here today and Congratulations to those of you who are here for being part of the treatment group. Uh, if you do see the other 50% of recipients uh, who turned up at the door and were randomly turned away, uh, please apologise from us. Uh, but I know, as they will, how great it is to have been part of this first Brookings Book Launch randomised trial. In 2013... A group of Finnish doctors published the results of a randomised trial of knee surgery performed for a torn meniscus, which is the piece of cartilage that provides a cushion between the thigh bone and the shin bone. The operation is known as a meniscectomy and is performed millions of times a year around the world. The randomised trial was based on sham surgery, in which patients consent to being assigned either to a regular surgery or to being cut open and sewn up again without the surgery being performed. Not only is the patient assigned to true surgery or placebo surgery, effectively based on the toss of a coin, they're not told even afterwards which group they're in. And that 2013 randomised experiment showed that among middle-aged patients, a meniscectomy was no more effective than sham surgery. Not everyone welcomed the result. Uh, an editorial in the journal Arthroscopy thundered that sham surgery randomised trials were ludicrous. The editors went so far as to argue that because no right-minded patients would participate in sham surgeries, the results were not generalisable to mentally healthy patients. <laughs> but sham surgeries are growing in importance, as increasingly people realise the placebo effect in surgery might well be higher than in any other area of medicine. A recent study found that three quarters of patients say they feel better after surgery. But then in half the cases, those who got sham surgery experience just as big an improvement in their well-being as those who got the real surgery. And that suggests that there's millions of people every year undergoing surgeries that make them feel better but that their gain in well-being would be just as high if they were sliced open while the surgeon played easily, easy listening music and then sewn back up again. And despite the advocacy of randomist to surgeons, randomised surgery trials remain in their infancy. Surgeon Ian Harris said that one of the problems is that patients sometimes regard aggressive surgeons as heroic and conservative surgeons as cowardly. Now, this room includes some of the world's experts in randomised trials, but just to make sure we're on the same page, let me kick off with a simple example of what a typical randomised trial looks like. Suppose we want to test the impact of getting a bit more sleep on depression by doing an experiment with 100 or so people in this room. If we toss coins, we'd end up with 50 people in the treatment group and 50 people in the control group. Now, we might ask people... In the head, for whom the coin came up heads, to get an extra hour's sleep. And the next day, we might survey both groups and look at the level of depression. If we found for those, that those for whom the coin turned up heads were less depressed, we could reasonably conclude that a little more snooze helps you lose the blues. And the beauty of a randomised trial such as this is it gets around problems that might plague an observational analysis, such as the possibility of reverse causality. Perhaps depression is causing insomnia. Randomised trials have a long tradition in medicine, going back to James Lynn's work on scurvy, Ambrose Paré's work on treating battlefield burns. In the 1800s, a randomised trial showed that bloodletting, a common treatment of the day, didn't cure patients. Alas, that randomised trial was reported 
just a bit too late for the field of medicine, which had by then called one of its leading journals The Lancet. <laughs> In 1945, US medical doctors attempting to treat tuberculosis gave an experimental treatment, streptomycin, to three patients. One died, one went blind, and the third made a full recovery. His name was Bob Dole. Now, one in three wasn't a great success rate, but the drug seemed promising. So British researcher Austin Bradford Hill uh, said that because the drug was too scarce to give it to every needy patient in Britain, it would be unethical not to conduct a randomised trial of streptomycin. The drug worked, and for the first time, we had an effective treatment for a disease that has killed over a billion people. A trial in 1954 randomly injected 600,000 American schoolchildren with either polio vaccine or salt water. The vaccine worked, and the next year, mass immunisation for polio of all American schoolchildren began. In the 1960s, there were randomised trials used to test drugs for diabetes, blood pressure, and the contraceptive pill. And for my own part, randomised trials of shaped how I look after my health. I used to take a daily multivitamin tablet until I read a meta-analysis in the New England Journal of Medicine showing that for otherwise healthy people, there's no evidence that vitamins help you live longer and some that vitamin supplements might be associated with a slightly shorter life. Not wanting to send myself to an early grave, I stopped taking the daily multivitamin. The same goes for fish oil tablets, uh, shown to be effective in a small-scale study, uh, but in a larger meta-analysis, uh, not shown to be effective. After I've done a marathon, I'll wear compression socks based on a randomised trial of marathoners' recovery rates, which showed that they did better when they wore compression socks after the race. And when I have to take a Band-Aid off one of my three sons, I'll point them to the James Cook University randomised trial which tested the fast removal method against the slow removal method. <laughs> and I'll assure them that by taking it off quickly, I'm reducing their total pain. <laughs> In the field of crime and justice, we've learned from the randomised trials of restorative justice conferencing, bringing offender and victim together to discuss what the perpetrator might do to repair the harm they've caused. Cases judged suitable for restorative justice are allocated randomly either to it or to the traditional criminal justice processes. And interestingly, the restorative justice studies show that it not only reduces crime, but it also helps healing among the victims. One study asked the victims of violence if they would harm the offender if they got the chance. Cases that had gone to court had half the victims saying they would take revenge if they could. Cases that went to restorative justice had just a tenth of the victims saying that they still wanted to take revenge. Some crime and justice experiments are more radical still. In 1970, the California Parole Board decided to test the impact on crime of reduce, releasing prisoners early. They took 3,000 prisoners who were coming up for release and using a random table of numbers, let half of them out six months early. Subsequently, they followed up to look at the re-offending rates and found no difference between the two groups, suggesting that that extra six months behind bars wasn't doing anything to make the streets safer. In social policy, we've gained valuable insights from randomised trials conducted by organisations such as Mathematica and MDRC and pioneering, pioneering randomistas, such as Judy Graham. After conducting over 30 large-scale social policy trials with more than 300,000 participants, she's developed some valuable maxims, such as, never say something about the research is too complex to get into. If someone is unreservedly enthusiastic about a randomised trial from the outset, it's probably because they don't understand it. And if your detractors claim it's unfair to turn away worthy, worthy participants, make sure you spend your last dollar serving everyone in the treatment group so you can't say that you, had, you, could, you could have feasibly served anyone else. 
In the classroom, we're learning a lot from randomised trials. One experiment funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation looked at coaching programs for teachers. Each month, teachers in the treatment group sent videos of their lessons to an expert coach who worked with them to try new techniques and iron out uh, imperfections in their teaching. And by the end of the year, teachers randomly selected into the coaching program had student gains equivalent to several extra months of learning. Another randomised trial looked at the Promise Academy, a school in Harlem that operates on a no-excuses model, where the days sometimes run as long as 8am to 7pm. To give you a sense of the magnitude of the effects, the average black high schooler in the United States is two to four years behind his or her white counterpart. Students who won the lottery to attend the Promise Academy improved their performance by enough to close the black-white test score gap. As lead researcher Roland Fryer put it, this overturns that fatalistic view that poverty is entrenched and that schools can't make a transformational difference. He calls it the equivalent to curing cancer for those kids. Developing countries are awash with randomised trials. In Indonesia, a randomised trial tested the impact on students of randomly doubling teacher pay. In India, a randomised trial of 19 million people estimated the impact on corruption of the rollout of biometrically identified smart cards. In one Mexican city, the mayor found that she didn't have enough money to pave all of the roads in the city. And so as a way of learning something about the impact of road paving and assuaging voter anger, she allowed a group of university researchers to randomly choose which half of the streets would be paved. If you participate in the modern economy, you're probably part of multiple randomised trials. Indeed, you've probably been part of randomised trials today. Among the nation's largest restaurants, retailers and financial institutions, at least a third are running randomised experiments. Netflix hones its algorithms based on experiments. Western Union used randomised experiments to decide what combination of fixed fees and foreign exchange fees to charge its customers. CVS once tested the impact of an in-store promotion by pausing it in 400 randomly selected stores. To the surprise of management, the promotion wasn't working. Profits rose in those 400 stores and the promotion was stopped across the chain. Cora, a question and answer site, devotes a tenth of its staff to running randomised trials and estimates it's doing about 30 experiments at any given time. One expert says of the Amazon homepage that virtually every pixel on that page has had to justify its existence based <laughs> on A-B testing. And in retail, if you're wondering why about half of all published prices end in nine, you can blame randomised trials conducted by marketing researchers. The shade of blue on the Google toolbar is the result of a randomised trial run by Marissa Mayer when she was then a vice president at Google. One of the engineers had worked out that blue was the optimal colour and in order to work out which shade of blue, they took 40 possibilities, divided the user base into groups of 2.5% and then tested which got the highest click through. Based on billions of clicks, they selected the optimal colour and the experiment is, uh, according to Google's estimates, uh, uh, one that added $200 million a year to the bottom line. Now this is important because Google scientists have access to about 15 exabytes of data, to about 40,000 searches per second. Google is the ultimate big data company. So if they think it's worth running randomised trials, no other organisation on the planet has an excuse for saying that big data means you don't have to do randomised trials. Randomised trials are integral to the experience of other firms, eBay, Intuit, Humana, Chrysler, United Airlines and Lyft. Uh, one CEO who enjoys conducting randomised trials said that his firm has three rules. You don't steal, you don't harass women and you've got to have a control group. And yes, you can be fired for any of those three things. You can even use randomised trials in your own life. Uh, last year I used Google Ads to run a small experiment of my own. Anyone who searched the internet uh, for terms around experiments or randomised might have seen an ad 
for a, an attractive new book about randomised trials. Web surfers were randomly shown one of 12 possible titles. My editors and I had agreed to call the book Randomistas, but we disagreed about the subtitle. So we le left the subtitle choice to a randomised experiment. A week later, 4,000 people had seen one of the ads, and we had our worst performing title, Randomistas, How a Powerful Tool Changed Our World. Moving up the rankings, the silver medal went to Randomistas, The Secret Power of Experiments, and the gold medal to Randomistas, How Radical Researchers Are Changing Our World. The experiment took about an hour to set up, cost about $50. It wasn't the first time I'd tested this, uh, a title through uh, this sort of approach. I'd done a book on inequality, which my mother thought should be called Battlers and Billionaires. My editor thought should be called Fair Enough. Uh, we uh, put it to the test, and my mother's title had three times the click-through rate of my editor's title. My editor graciously concluded the evidence was in, and Battlers and Billionaires hit the shelves the following year. Now, the randomised... Randomised trials aren't without their critics. Indeed, the word randomistas uh, was originally coined by Nobel laureate Angus Deaton as a critique of what he saw as the overuse of the technique in development economics. It's no coincidence that randomistas rhymes with sandinistas. And as a uh, famous article in the uh, uh, British Medical Journal once noted, just because parachutes haven't been tested in a clinical trial, you probably wouldn't forego one if you had to jump out of a plane. It's also true that randomised trials won't tell us the impact of denuclearisation on the Korean Peninsula, of raising interest rates, of permitting Sprint to merge with T-Mobile. It's also true that even where we have randomised evidence, we should be wary about extrapolating results into very different contexts. Just because quality preschool worked in 1960s Ypsilanti, it doesn't mean it's the perfect answer in modern-day Yemen. But that applies not just to randomised trials, but to any evaluation, including a before-after study. It's also true that randomised trials can cost millions of dollars and take decades. But not every randomised trial needs to be like Perry's Preschool or the Rand Health Insurance experiment. We've seen a proliferation lately of fast, low-cost randomised trials. Businesses who are using randomised trials to tweak process over the course of a day. Government agencies now taking advantage of administrative data to massively bring down the cost of randomised trials. Five years ago, the White House, working with the Arnold Foundation, announced a competition for randomised trials that cost less than $200,000. From over 50 entries, the three winners included a federal government department planning to carry out unexpected workplace health and safety inspections and a Boston non-profit providing intensive counselling to low-income youth, hoping to be the first in their family to graduate college. And the competition continues to operate through the Arnold Foundation, which has now announced that it's going to fund all proposals that receive a high rating from its review panel. And for those at the cutting edge of research, a central challenge now is about more effectively melding theory with randomised evaluations to build more accurate models of human behaviour. Yes, there'll always be a place for a randomised trial that tests whether people are more likely to open a piece of direct mail if it comes in a red envelope or a blue envelope. But some of the most valuable randomised trials are those that are providing deeper insights. Discussing what he's learned from running randomised trials in Liberia, Chris Blattman reflects that instead of asking, does the program work, the better question is, how does the world work? And Blattman argues that by testing fundamental assumptions, it's possible to produce insights that will generalise across programs. To conclude, in the early 2000s, successful businessman Blake McCoskey visited villages outside Buenos Aires and was struck by what he saw. He said, I knew somewhere in my mind that poor children around the world often went barefoot. But now, he said, I saw for the first time the real effects of being shoeless, the blisters, the sores, the infections. And so to provide children shoes to, to these children, McCoskey founded Shoes for Better Tomorrows, 
which is soon shortened to Tom's. The company made its customers a one-for-one -one promise. Buy a pair of shoes and a child in a developing country will get a pair. Tom's has so far given away over 60 million pairs of shoes. Six years in, McCoskey and his team wanted to know what impact Tom's was having. So they made the brave decision to let economists randomise free shoe distribution across 18 communities in El Salvador. The study showed that the canvas loafers didn't go to waste. Most children wore their new shoes most of the time. But the children's health wasn't any better. Tom's shoes were mostly replacing existing footwear. Free shoes weren't improving children's self-esteem, but they were making those communities feel more dependent on outsiders. Let's be clear about what that meant. Corporate philanthropy wasn't some kind of an add-on for Tom's. It was the firm's founding credo. And now a randomised trial was showing that among recipients in El Salvador, free shoes weren't doing much to improve child outcomes. And they might have even been fostering a sense of dependency. Yet rather than trying to discredit the evaluation, Tom's responded promptly. As lead researcher Bruce Wydick wrote, Tom's is perhaps the most nimble organisation any of us has ever worked with. An organisation that truly cares about what it's doing, seeks evidence-based results on its program and is committed to reorienting the nature of its intervention to maximise results. In response to children saying that the canvas loafer isn't their first choice, they often give away sports shoes. In response to the dependency issue, they want to pursue giving the shoes to children as a reward for school attendance and performance. Never once as researchers did we feel pressure to hide results that could shed an unfavourable light on the company. We applaud them for their transparency and commitment to evidence-based action among the poor. So no one should fault Blake McCoskey for setting up Tom's shoes, acting based on the best evidence of the time. But when new facts arrived, Tom shifted. And because of that, the Tom's randomised trial doesn't look like a failure at all. Blake McCoskey's goal in establishing the firm was to improve the health of poor children. They evaluated it, it didn't work, they changed tack. Test, learn, adapt is at the heart of randomised trials. We live in a world in which failure is surprisingly common. In medicine, only one in ten drugs that looks promising in lab tests ends up getting approval. In education, only a tenth of the randomised trials commissioned by the Watts Work Clearinghouse produce positive effects. In business, just a fifth of Google's randomised experiments help them improve the product. Rigorous social policy experiments ex estimate that only a quarter of programs have a strong positive effect. Randomised trials flourish where modesty meets numeracy. An experimenting society doesn't just mean we do more rigorous evaluation. It means we pay more attention to the facts. We're less dogmatic, more honest, more open to criticism and less defensive. We're more willing to change our theories when the data prove them wrong. Ethically done, randomised trials can change the world for the better. So, time to toss a few coins? Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that stimulating speech, Andrew. I'm going to invite the rest of our panel also to take their seats uh, and prepare their comments. I will introduce them as they... You, you can come to this side, either way. Um, I'd forgotten the multivitamins bit from your, from your book, where you actually find that multivitamins, if anything, slightly make you slightly more likely to die. It worries me because my wife is actually quite scientific and she's been making me take multivitamins for the last 10 years, so I'm now doubting her motives. Um, I, also, I also forgot to mention that Andrew uh, hosts a podcast, The Good Life, uh, which is available on Apple iTunes. And if you can find another person who's a front-ranked politician, an author, and has their own podcast on iTunes, then I don't know who they are. So I'm going to introduce the panel in the order, order which they're going to speak, and you can see them uh, from your right to your left as you look across the panel. We're going to start with uh, Professor Thomas Cook, who is Professor Emeritus of Sociology at Northwestern University. He specialises in social science methods for inferring causation, obviously highly relevant, has authored and edited many books, including uh, quasi-experimental design, experimentation design, and analysis issues for field settings. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He has been a trustee and board member of the Russell Sage Foundation. He's been awarded the Gunnar Myrdal Prize for, uh, for Science by the American Evaluation Association, but most strikingly to me, uh, has been on the board of the Textile Museum in Washington, D.C., 
We're going to hear next from uh, John Barron, who is Vice President of Evidence-Based Policy at the Laura and John Arnold Foundation, have already been mentioned, uh, and I'll have to give a disclaimer in a moment, where he leads the Foundation's investments in rigorous research aimed at growing the body of evidence-based social programs. Um, before that, he was the founder and president of the Coalition for Evidence-Based Policy from 2001 to 2015. He's twice nominated by the President of the United States and confirmed by the Senate to serve on the National Board for Educational Sciences and was uh, serving as the board chairman during the last year of his uh, second term. As the Arnold Foundation are, are funding this event and our funders of ES, I now have to give a slight disclaimer. I'm going to do it like we talked a lot about medicine today, so I'm going to do it the way you do in the US where you say this drug might, might help you with allergies, but on the other hand it might also kill you. Um, so uh, that's, here's the disclaimer. The Arnold Foundation provides generous support to economic studies, which ha helps make the work we do possible. I'd like to reiterate Brookings' commitment to independence and underscore that the views expressed today are solely those of the speaker. In other words, it might help your allergies, but it also might kill you. Um, and then lastly, uh, Rebecca Maynard, who is uh, the University Trustee Chair Professor of Education and Social Policy at the University of Pennsylvania. She's a leading expert in the design and conduct of randomized control trials, especially in the areas of education and social policy. Until 2016, I think, she was director of the University of Pennsylvania's pre-doctoral training program in interdisciplinary methods for field-based education research. Uh, until 2012, she was commissioner of the National Center for Education Evaluation and Regional Assistance at the Institute, for, uh, Institute of Education Sciences. And while she was there, uh, she actually oversaw a number of initiatives, including the What Works Clearinghouse, which Andrew's just mentioned, as well as the Regional Education Laboratories and the National Library of Education. So um, I defy you to find a better panel to talk about the issues raised, both empirical, uh, uh, research-oriented, and political, as the panel that you're going to hear from next. Each of them is going to speak for about five minutes, then we'll have a discussion. So with that, Professor Cook. Yeah, uh, I think it's easier if you stay seated, yeah. if you don't mind. Yeah, just stay there, but just push the button on the microphone. There you go. So when it's red, you're alive. Okay, great. Oh, it's red. I'm alive. No. <laughs> <laughs> Rosso, ego sum. Okay, well, this book was great fun to read. It was really, really interesting and great examples. And um, I was struck, actually, by even the fun in the title because of the allusion to Angus Deaton and his pejorative use of the word randomista. And you take him on, basically, and take his own title and turn it around and sort of throw it in his face. But Angus was referring, by the choice of randomista, to the random assignment as a social movement. He was interested as a social movement within developmental economics, writ small, and economics writ large. But as a sociologist, it is easy to see it as a social movement. And I want to talk about that a bit uh, to present the context of this book. For a social movement, you have to have a clear and simple message. And for randomistas, it is random assignment is the gold standard for causal inference. There has to be some bad guys in context. And bad guys are sort of the observational studies, quasi-experiments, non-experiments. This should have interesting examples of the use of the movement you're promoting to be able to talk about and write about interestingly, and some good examples from random assignment in the book. You should be able to enlist support for the movement, and there's all kinds of mechanisms for enlisting support. For example, in education, they enlisted support 20 years ago for random assignment through things like uh, only doing randomized experiments for national evaluations, only funding randomized experiments for field-initiated research, putting randomized experiments particularly high in um, uh, work done by regional labs, setting up training workshops for random assignment, setting up an organization called SRI to promote random assignment, setting up a journal called the Journal of, Ra of research and education effectiveness designed to promote randomized assignment. So this was a movement with all kinds of different institutional bases to support the message. And what this book is, is a celebration of the movement through these great examples, this well-written 
uh, uh, prose, this wonderful historical overview, and it's a celebration of the movement. However, there's a tension, and the tension is between random assignment as a social movement and random assignment as a scientific proposition. Now, there's no difference in the theory supporting randomized experiments and non-randomized experiments, right? We all know the theory behind randomized experiments based upon traditional sampling theory. If you go to any statistician, they will say, well, you can get perfect causal inference out of any non-experiment, provided that the strong ignorability assumption is met, provided that, economists would call it, the conditional independence assumption is met. Other people would say, providing that the assumption of no hidden biases is met. So in theory, there's not a problem. There's no advantage to randomized experiments. The advantage comes in practice, because the requirements for meeting the assumptions of randomized experiments are fewer, more clear, and more easily diagnosed in the data compared to the assumptions required for non-experiments. Right? So the advantage of experiments is about practice. It's not about theory at all. Now, it's one thing to say that it's easier to meet the assumptions and know they're met with randomized experiment, but how many assumptions are there and what are there? I just finished a paper for social science and medicine listing the 26 assumptions required for saying that a any given causal hypothesis in a single study is well met. And it's impossible in any one single study to meet all those 26 assumptions. Right? The randomized experiment does very well on the threats to internal validity, right, which could come about because you choose an incorrect random assignment procedure, you use the correct procedure but implement it wrongly, or because you have cor uh, treatment correlated attrition from the experiment, or because you have small sample sizes and sampling error leads to an inadvertent difference between the groups. There are problems. Those things can be dealt with, but in any one study, you're not certain they're perfectly dealt with. Similarly, the statistical tests involve some complications, and some people get them wrong when you have clustering, when you have too many comparisons, etc. There are real issues of construct validity all the while in randomized experiments. What does this treatment represent as an abstract notion? What does this outcome measure represent? Do I have the right contrast group? There are fights all over the social sciences about whether you should compare something to a strong comparison group like the sham things you're talking about versus not. In mental health, there's a huge fight right now between the psychiatrists who want active control groups and the psychologists who want passive control groups because one of them is more likely to get you effects. Then there are the problems of external validity. So 26 assumptions for any one single experiment to be trustworthy. Um, there's a tension here between celebrating a social movement like Random Assignment and the books that do that so well, like this one, and struggling with all the contingencies, assumptions that randomized experiments are required to be totally interpretable. If you were to write the last kind of book, which is a scientific book, no of you would want to read it. You'd all fall asleep. If you write the celebratory book as part of the social movement, and he's clearly part of the social movement, that's great. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. John. <coughs> the button I'm yeah, supposed to see press? The, the one in the middle? Yes. Oops. Got it. Uh, so okay. So I really enjoyed this book uh, and would recommend it. Uh, but let me provide some context for my opinion. Uh, I enjoy at cocktail parties exchanging stories about surpri latest surprising findings from randomized trials. Um, on vacation, I enjoy, you know, when my wife and I are on the beach, she's reading the novel uh, in her chair, and I'm with my iPad reading the latest randomized trial on my, on my iPad. So just to, you know... That's what Ron Haskins is doing right now. I'm sure. <laughs> Place that in context. Um, uh, so um, one of the things I, and I think you, uh, my guess is, enjoy about reading randomized trials is that if it's a high-quality randomized experiment, large sample, no major flaws, uh, um, long-term follow-up, valid outcome measures, it gives you a window 
into the truth. And you don't have to trust the experts. You don't have to, uh, you can put aside a zillion observational studies on the question. Um, you can see it for yourself. The uh, British Royal Society, its motto is in Latin, nullius in verba, which means on the word of no one. And when you're reading a high-quality randomized controlled trial, it allows you to do exactly that, to take nobody's word for it. You can see the high school graduation rate for the treatment group versus the control group for yourself. Now, I, would, I, uh, I think the book does make a compelling case for... Um, uh, doing more trials and for this approach to social policy, but I would like to uh, elaborate on aspects of it um, that I, we, uh, in my work, my organization's work, we do a lot of um, uh, communications work with policy officials in Congress, the federal agencies, we've been doing this for 15 years, trying to make the case for why to experiment and why use the results of experiments. And often when you try to explain it, uh, people will say, oh, yeah, yeah, of course you should do a rigorous evaluation. Why not? Um, but in the back of their mind, I think what is going on is, yes, it would be nice to do this, but it's optional. You know, maybe it would be nice to put a randomized trial on this thing, but maybe, a, you know, what if I do a bronze standard study instead, a typical observational study? Um, it's not ideal, but it's pretty good. Or what if... I mean, we're spending money on youth programs or education programs. Uh, we've got to be doing some good, uh, aren't we? Um, so, the, um, so the randomized experiment is viewed as an optional add-on. And I think it's not that. I think uh, the um, examples you gave in your book and the numbers more generally show that most across many different fields, medicine, education, well, for unemployment, criminal justice, most attempts to improve on current practice fail. The large majority of well-conducted randomized trials do not produce the hope for effects. Uh, you gave the numbers in medicine. Uh, most even phase two studies, which are small randomized trials or quasi-experiments in medicine, are overturned when a larger, more definitive study is done in phase three, the kind of study needed to get FDA approval for marketing. In education, uh, since the Institute of Education Sciences was created in 2002, it started funding big randomized field experiments in education. Uh, close to 90% of the programs that were evaluated across many different kinds, different curricula, teacher training programs, school choice programs, and so on, close to 90% were found to produce weak or no effects on student achievement compared to what schools were doing anyway in the control group. Um, that is true in a lot of different fields, and uh, it's true in criminal justice and in welfare and employment and so on. What it means is that if you don't have a valid way, if if the policy field does not have a valid way to identify the relatively small number of interventions that do produce meaningful effects, and then to put them into widespread use, it's hard to see how you make progress in improving student achievement, in, in uh, reducing poverty, and addressing other social problems. And it may be one of the main reasons why the current system, which is... Um, government by guesswork or you know, by plausible idea before it's tested, money going out the old-fashioned way, why that's not producing, why the, it's not producing the hope for effects, why the poverty numbers have not improved substantially over many years, why the uh, reading and math achievement and so on of high school graduates is still very low uh, and not improving substantially over time. So. Uh, I would just add to uh, what was an, uh, an excellent book with the, the observation that um, evidence-based policy and randomized experiments offer a path to progress that spending as usual based on uh, guesswork cannot. Thank you, John. I was reminded, actually, when you were speaking of one of the nice phrases in the book, Andrew, where you, say, you talk about medicine, you say that eminence based medicine has been replaced by evidence-based medicine, which is just a, 
an example of your ability to uh, turn a phrase as well as to uh, write such an excellent book. Uh, last but not least, Rebecca. Okay, well, uh, you know, I'm going to say this this uh, book was truly fabulous. Uh, I am not one to sit down and, and read a book of this uh, magne this length in, in two days, but, uh, but I did so. Um, and I've worked in this field for 40 years, and I, I, I learned a, an awful lot by, um, because of the breadth of coverage in this book. What really stands out, I think, is a lot of the, the, a lot of the, the wars over methods really um, mix up two things. What is the question that we care about? And what is the method that is best for that question? So we, we, we need to keep in mind that the, that the question we're ta questions we're talking about here are questions of causality. There are lots of other questions that, that uh, warrant research um, and can be answered by other forms of, of research. But when the question is causal, most often, you really want to try to get to the, to the um, randomized control trial if you if you care about the answer and and why do the study if you don't really care about the answer. I'm just going to make a, a few points that stand out for me as I read this um, book. One of the most overlooked roles for randomized control trials, um, uh, I think, especially in the social sciences, is improvements in routines of practice. Um, that is working. Um, in ways that yield better outcomes than the things that we're doing every day. Uh, this is um, where, where randomized controlled trials got a lot of traction in medicine. That has not been true in the social sciences so much. Uh, right now, I've been working on uh, programs that want to improve their outcomes. They know where they're going. They're not there. We get inside, and we do the randomized controlled trials within the programs, short term, um, quick, easy, cheap, and it, it, it moves them in the right direction at the end. So I, I think that's a, an area that I would say we, we have uh, largely overlooked in social science. Second, um, I want to emphasize that the review platforms, these are talked about in Andrew's book, but I want to say that if we do not have evidence review platforms, uh, we are, are, are like the What Works Clearinghouse or CrimesSolution.gov, uh, we are going to have a lot of the evidence sitting on shelves or sitting in computers and not being used. Uh, the, the, these articles that academics write are behind paywalls. Uh, the people who are running programs, running, making policy decisions, don't have the time, the capacity to go out and find the 45 studies, synthesize, you know, judge the quality, sort the, the good from the bad, line them up and make sense of them. So there needs to be some assist there. And evaluators have a responsibility when we write our reports to feed into that evidence review uh, mentality, to make it easy for people to extract the information that will allow you to know what question I answered, how well I answered it, what the answer is, and how that fits into your, your uh, policy or practice space. Third is um, transparency is really paramount. There's too much of the evidence being generated by the randomistas, and I'm one of those randomistas, um, is the product of opportunistic analyses. Uh, of existing data from prior studies. I would say that the Perry Preschool study drives me crazy. I love the study as it was originally designed. It was designed, it had a theory of change, it had a program um, question. Uh, they randomized, they did, there's a little mess in the, in the design, but we can, we can overlook that, it's still pretty good. But these questions that they're asking 40 years later, what questions did they ask where they didn't get the answer that made headlines and didn't report the results on, okay? Do we really believe that they followed all of those 123 children for 40 years? Do results from 1965 pertain to 2018? I think a lot of questions there. So that was a, the, the recent research has been very opportunistic. Um, there's also a lot of phishing, a lot of p-hacking. It's talked about in the book, so to technical terms, but we publish some results, other results we put aside, or we don't get quite the results we want, so we run it with a different set of covariates. Um, or a different subsample. So the pre, there is some discussion in the books of how we can get around this, ra this transparency issue. Um, randomized control trials are powerful tools, but as Andrew points out over and over in the book, they're a tool designed to get reliable uh, answers um, to the causal question. We also need to think about things like benefits, costs, and consequences of uh, the, uh, these for program and policy decisions, which aren't the same as this program worked in this condition. We've got lots of other things. Do we want to build roads or do we want to fix schools? Uh, sometimes uh, it's not as easy as I found a statistically significant effect. 
And the last thing I want to say is that generally it is really best, in my opinion, for people like myself to abstain from making policy recommendations based on the findings of my studies. I think my obligation is to tell you what questions I um, addressed, how I addressed them, what I found, and give you enough context so that you can decide whether or not this pertains to you and what to do with it. Thank you, Rebecca, and thank you to all of you um, for those, those comments. Just a reminder that if you're watching this, there is the hashtag randomistas. And if you are um, wanting to ask questions and you're watching on the webcast, please feel free to use that hashtag um, to ask a question. I'll be looking at it when we turn to the audience. But let's just um, turn back to the panel for a moment. Uh, let's start with one of the arguments that's used against randomized control trials. And Andrew, let's start with you and then perhaps go along the panel again for any other thoughts, which is the, the idea of denying benefits uh, to a particular group and the ethics, the, the ethical difficulties that that poses. Uh, I mean, the most striking example is obviously the sham surgeries where you cut a hole in me, sew me up again, and don't tell me whether or not, or not I've had the surgery. But there are many, many areas where it, sort of, it feels almost cruel if we have reason to believe that something works. Let's say it's going to help a two-year-old over the next year to not develop a particular disease. How difficult it is to ask practitioners to say, no, no, just flip a coin and half of the kids will get it and half of them won't. And how do you think that the randomisters have best tackled that particular barrier? So uh, one of the lines I, uh, I quite like is sociologist Adam Gamoran, who says that if you know a program works, it's unethical to conduct a randomised trial, to deny it to people. If you don't know for sure that a program works, he argues it's unethical not to conduct a randomised trial and to collect evidence uh, because your randomised trial could be hurting people. Uh, it serves sometimes to uh, think about programs that we now know to have been doing active harm. Uh, in medicine, you think about uh, the morning sickness drug thalidomide and the damage that that did to, uh, to, to babies and the birth deformities it caused. A uh, randomised trial of thalidomide, uh, I don't think I want, uh, want to be in the treatment group. Uh, there's Scared Straight, the program which uh, suggested that spending a day behind bars might cause delinquent youths to uh, move away from shoplifting and lead lives in the straight and narrow, and turned out to be increasing crime, uh, perhaps because uh, when they saw the inside of a jail, they discovered it wasn't as bad as they'd thought. Uh, again, you want your child to be in the control group for the Scared Straight random randomised trial. Uh, and then there's simply the argument of, uh, of, of limitations on resources. So if we're rolling out a program over the course of two years, um, it's uh, uh, very straightforward in both a practical and an ethical sense uh, to say we can't roll it out to all communities in the first year, let's randomly select who gets it in year one and year two. Um, that's how the Progressor conditional, ca conditional cash transfer mm. experiment comes about. Uh, the Mexican uh, government just agrees to randomise across year one, year two distribu distributions. Mm. Thomas, do you have anything to add on that? Yeah. Uh, I actually have a chair in ethics and justice, mm. so I could go on forever, but I won't. <laughs> <laughs> and I will, uh, I think, quote something from Fred Mostella, a dearly departed um, uh, uh, statistician, who posed the following question. He said... Does the ethics of denying a treatment to somebody versus the ethics of continuing to do what you did without knowing whether it works? So he is in actually posing the issue of whether it's not better to let some people suffer because of randomization when there'll be many fewer than those who would have benefited from it if it works or would be absolved from it if it was iatrogenic and its consequences? So it's a good question. Yeah, I would just add to the comments that were made about when you've got an over program, you can't serve everybody, you use a random lottery, basically determine who gets it, who doesn't. People will accept that usually as ethical. But beyond that, uh, just to reinforce the point about a lot of, you know, you're denying services, in many cases, just empirically looking at randomized trials, um, the program group doesn't do better than the treatment group. You're not denying something beneficial. And it, you may have an iatrogenic effect. Uh, one recent high-profile example of that was the just-published uh, randomized trial of the Tennessee pre-K um, study, which was a large, well-conducted trial with a follow-up in third grade, which found an adverse effect on academic achievement for the children in the treatment group who had, gone, who had been randomly assigned to preschool versus those in the control group who had not. So 
I think uh, a randomized trial, as I think you have said, I'm going to steal your words here, <laughs> is a fair way to allocate both the ben potential benefits and the potential risks of any, uh, of any uh, uh, program. So, uh, Rebecca, do you agree with yourself? <laughs> I absolutely agree. First of all, did he more. quote you directly? So I'm going to ask you, do, do you agree with yourself? And, he, and then I was actually going to ask you to do something else, which I want to throw back to the rest of the panel. I'm very struck by your point about daily, small-scale kind of practice type stuff. I think you're right that in social policy, it's the voucher scheme to move people or the charter school or the lottery. It's very kind of big structural changes that are kind of most exciting, rather than how about if you start school 20 minutes later or how about if you teach English in this particular way or change the book or something like that, which is much... So can you give any more examples of that? Because um, I'd like to take that back to the panel too, because most of the most examples from social policy in your book are of the bigger kind, not all, but of the bigger kind. So can you do both those? Well, let me uh, let, let me start by giving you an example of of you know that just deals with the the, the ethics question, um, and I think we'll also get into this question. Um, the state of Maine a few years ago decided to give every seventh grader a notebook computer. Um, and they did it all in one year. Uh, and when they did that, they re they so they made all their investment in one year. When they did that, they realized right away that there were all kinds of things that they hadn't thought about, like um, this: the, the 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 teachers were not trained to actually produce the assignments for the for the computers. Um, the some of the children didn't actually have internet access for the computers. Some of the children had had internet access, but there hadn't been policies worked out to f determine where you could go on that internet. And these are seventh grade boys. Um, so there were lots of issues. Uh, there were issues around breakage. There were issues around, you know, policies. Um, so just imagine uh, what, how, what, even if this is a, this might be a, a wonderful idea, but imagine that the the state had taken that investment, decided to spread it over three years, decided to randomly decide which schools got the computers in what, what year, and started up slowly, concentrated all their technical support on a third of the schools, not all of the schools all at once, learned and, and improved their practices over time. Uh, perhaps the next, next, they might even try different strategies. Okay, so that's just an example of an opportunity that was uh, for, you know, foregone. They lost the opportunity to learn as they rolled that out. Okay, so the, the recent uh, research on, on uh, teacher professional development, we spend millions and millions and millions of dollars on teacher professional development in this country um, every year. Uh, the evidence suggests that the teacher professional development that we are providing is not any better than what is going on for t to support teachers anyhow. So it's not that maybe you shouldn't do teacher professional development, but maybe you should try something different than you're doing, so why not be a little more planful with that? Um, and the third thing I, I, example I will give you is a, a, a program that we're working with where uh, they have very high attrition from a community college. Um, we needed to do something about that. The program had a problem they needed to solve. Their instincts were to go out and just do something different, which is, that, which is what they always do. They'll look at data. They'll, they'll be smart about it. But we said, wait a minute. Let's actually, let's actually tr come up with some ideas of what will make this better, and let's actually implement it with half of the people, half of the students, not all of the students, and do it in a way that we have fair control groups. I, it, took, it took about two hours of conversation to, to get rid of all of the objections. They had a lot of good objections to randomization. We could work through them. My ch I take on the challenge. I say, I'm going to give you some starting values. You tell me where it pinches. I'm going to find a solution. So it has to be a can-do attitude. I have to solve their, their, their design problems in order to implement this fairly. What happened is we learned so much. We raised participation rates or retention rates by 10 percentage points in one cycle. Uh, and, and then we got to do it again. We got to improve it and do it again. The random assignment gave us unbiased estimates of how much progress we were making. If we had used program data, we would have, we would have shut down some of the sites. We would have made the wrong decisions because the program data, <laughs> cohort to cohort, was not giving us an accurate estimate of the impact of the program because of the natural fluctuation, fluctuation in the retention rates. The program is thrilled with this very short-term 
embedded experiment, and I think you will see them doing a lot more of this. Andrew, I'm going to come next to you then on this question of daily, daily practice. You, you give the example of the doctors versus midwives where the doctor's mortality rates were higher because they weren't washing their hands. Uh, and so the, it, changing the protocol to wash the hands saved mm. however many lives. Um, so I guess kind of asking in social policy, there aren't enough of the kind of hand-washing type RCTs. They're more of the build a whole new hospital or try a whole different drug kind of RCT. Is that a fair comment? And if so, why is that okay? But I mean, part of that, presumably, Richard, is to, has to do with ethical clearance, that people feel uh, in medical context that they need to go through ethical approvals, and so that creates a, a hurdle, which probably means that some of the small-scale stuff isn't getting done. Uh, but, uh, but also just a, a matter of building in that steady feedback loop. Uh, you see within business a huge amount of that, uh, that sort of the hand-washing type, type experiments, mm. uh, firms doing A-B testing as a, as a matter of uh, routine, uh, Amazon Marketplace, uh, since uh, there was a scandal about a decade ago in which Amazon was doing its own pricing experiments, they promised they would never again do pricing experiments. So all the pricing experiments on Amazon are now done on Amazon Marketplace by third-party resellers, and there's a whole host of them doing that. Uh, and so there's, uh, that, that, uh, that, that sort of feedback loop is happening all over the place, and, and we're trying to do more of it in, uh, in uh, politics, uh, both in terms of thinking about the policy side, but also the political campaigning side as well. John, do you want to add anything on, on that? John or Thomas, actually. Can I add something? Oh. Um, these sort of background experiments like Amazon, Google, etc., which are part of the daily life and it's out of awareness even to individuals, um, they're going to be done because corporate interests want them to be done and they're going to be pushed. Now, when we come to... And what happens there, you can get a tiny, tiny, tiny effect that's then multiplied by one billion people, right? Mm -hmm. So the yeah. aggregate effect can be quite large, even mm. though the individual effect is tiny. In the social, behavioral, and economic world, we don't operate there, right? And we're presented with a conundrum, because we don't have this multiplied by a billion, right? So the conundrum for us is, if we do experiments on lots of little things, you know, starting the day 10 minutes later, et cetera, these background parts of daily life, these are small tweaks. And the chances of any one of them having effects that we're interested in are not very high. On the other hand, if we look at tweaking the big things in society, the structural things, the things that involve large incentives or disincentives that are part of your book and that make the book so interesting to read because it isn't about little trivial little tweaks. If we do those, we're finding out more and more that they don't seem to work. Now, that's important knowledge for knowledge. It's not important for many people in the political world out there who, after a time, will say randomized experiments, yeah, it's a good idea, but most of them don't work, right? We've got to find out the big tweaks that work and make a difference mm. because that makes a difference. Yeah, thank you. Actually, it, I was going to ask John anyway to expand along those lines as well as answer the previous one because when, I, when you listen to the numbers about the evaluations they come in, the, the hope, I think the idea in the minds of the randomistas is, well, we did this thing, we tried it, we did a good evaluation, it didn't work, so let's do something else and see if that works. Oh, that didn't work, never mind, let's do something else. And um, There's this kind of a constant hunger to keep finding it, but actually what might happen is fatalism sets in, um, and you start to think, oh, nothing worked, um, or that can become the danger of it. And so when I listen to those numbers, so I wanted to ask, a, I think, a related question, which is, if it, so much doesn't work, that does that end does the whole literature run the risk of engendering fatalism rather than experimentation? Um, I think that's an extremely good question. Uh, the, be, and there's some, um, a lot of folks go into a randomized trial thinking, oh, well, you know, our program probably works. <laughs> and in most cases, it turns out the effects are not found. And the lesson to be learned may be, don't do a rigorous evaluation in the future. Right. Um, uh, that may be true of a number of the paper success experiments around the United States that, um, uh, you know, some of the initial results have not been promising. People, a lot of investors put money into it. And if you don't have positive effects and pay for success, which is basically some, a form of pay for outcomes, pay for impacts, uh, um, it could uh, 
hurt the whole movement. Mm -hmm. uh, I, so I think it is, I think the field needs to be much more um, careful about what to evaluate. Uh, one of the things that we do at the Arnold Foundation is uh, we fund a lot of randomized trials. We're funding, uh, in at my division alone, we're funding over 50 uh, randomized trials. And one of the entry criteria, the criteria we look for, is that there's promising prior evidence. There's a strong signal from the prior research, whether it's quasi-experimental or a pilot randomized trial or so on, a signal that a meaningful effect is plausible. And, um, and that's where we put our investment. In other words, to learn, use existing research to optimize the chances of finding something that does produce meaningful impacts. And we're producing, at least in the early results, our share of null findings. But uh, there are some positive findings. One of the examples that you gave of bottom line, the college counseling experiment, that's a big multi-site randomized control trial uh, showing at least at the two-year follow-up about an eight percentage point improvement in the number of uh, youth that are enrolled in college compared to the control group. And uh, I, as I recall, about a 12 percentage point improvement in four-year uh, uh, college enrollment. Now we're going to continue measuring outcomes over the long term till through college graduation. Hopefully they won't fade. But the idea is I think you do need, uh, the field should plan for, uh, understand that it's much harder to find promising findings than commonly, positive findings than commonly appreciated and to use prior evidence to optimize chances of success. Thank, Andrew, I'm going to come to you and then back to Rebecca. So on that specific question, the fatalism uh, experimentation one, but maybe also I'm going to open to questions in the audience in a moment, so have your questions ready. But perhaps you can also use that to talk a bit about the politics of this too, because one of the things that strikes me about it, and I, I was in the UK government that introduced the nudge unit there, is that, to put this very crudely, what happens is that centre-left governments get persuaded this is a good idea. They fund all these trials. That shows that a bunch of programmes don't work, and then the right use that as an excuse to just shut everything down. Um, so that was, that was a bit of a simplification. But that's kind of, the, it's interesting to think about the ways in which this is received politically. Mm. So, it, so if you have, you know, the, uh, the, we have an idealized view of the political culture in which stuff, this stuff will be received, which is you trial something, you spend, I don't know, school improvement grants or whatever, you spend X billion on something in the hope of getting the result. You don't get it. And so one way to receive that as a political class is, well, that didn't work, but let's spend some money mm. on something mm. else in the hope that that will work. Another way to receive it is, I told you government doesn't really work. Uh, let's stop wasting money like this. And so, so in a way, it's kind of odd that quite often it's those who are on the centre-left who are supporting the very evaluations that undermine so many of the ideas so prized on the left about what's working and what isn't. So you get left-wing politicians funding RCTs that right-wing politicians use to shut everything down. Is that fair? Great question. So one of my heroes... Well, it was an accusation, really. A, <laughs> right <laughs> um, one of my heroes is a professor-turned-politician uh, the late great U.S. Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan, uh, and he was uh, he was fond of quoting Rossi's law, the uh, the notion that the expected uh, impact of any uh, well evaluated social program will be zero, uh, and famously referred to Judy Groen, who we've spoken about before, mm -hmm. uh, as Our Lady of Modest but Positive Results. Uh, so, and that's mm -hmm. how I tend to think of most of our so the effective social programs that uh, that probably. The world is not filled with moonshots and magic bullets, but with feasible programs that will make uh, uh, modest incremental impacts. Uh, we should also think about backstop programs. So in the development economic space, give directly the idea of uh, uh, you want to improve uh, uh, the lives of people in poor countries, you might just give them cash. Uh, or the earned income tax credit, uh, social security here as, uh, as, as being equivalents. Uh, but I, I think there's no contradiction between being um, optimistic about the challenges of inequality, full employment, closing the black-white test score gap, and scientific and critical about the means of, uh, of, of closer, closing those gaps, uh, about, uh, about assessing programs to, to work out what works and what doesn't. In much the same way as anybody who is serious about curing cancer uh, shouldn't be throwing their weight behind the latest thing to emerge out of the lab. Uh, they should be looking at what passes through phase one, two, three trials and actually turns out to be effective in the field. Uh, Rebecca, and then I might ask John the political question too. So I think one of the, the uh, weaknesses in the field is that we, th we, we think success is a randomized controlled trial that shows the expected effect and has little stars after it. And I think what we really should be aiming for is doing randomized controlled trials 
uh, in cases where we really should ask the question, is this a good thing to do? We are about to in, implement policy X. Is that going to give us the intended result, yes or no? So for example, when we implemented abstinence-only education funding in this country, there were huge battles. Is this, is this going to improve the health and well-being of young people, or is this going to be harmful to them? And, and, and children's health was at stake here. So that was something where if we were going to put that money on the stump anyhow, and there was this difference of opinion about, and, and, or, and lack of knowledge about the effectiveness of that, uh, that is something where you ought to do the study and you ought to celebrate a good answer to whether or not it is helpful or hurtful or does nothing, um, and, and rather than looking for treating it as a successful RCT if you get the result you wanted and an unsuccessful one otherwise. And I think that's mm -hmm. a lot of the a lot of the challenge. Um, the other on the other point, I, I you know I just want to say that. Um, I think if we, too often, we as evaluators drive what is being evaluated. We have the good idea. We cook up in the academy the new p professional development. What was different in the, the study I was just referring to on, on college persistence was we didn't design the study. The program had the problem. The program worked with us to come up with their solutions. They were tailored to the nuances of the individual sites, so they had the goal fixed, they had the parameters set, we had the direction agreed upon that was common, but each site tailored their own, um, their own strategy at very limited, they were going to do something anyhow, at very limited cost, they improved their retention rates by 10 percentage points in a six month period. We don't hear of things like that. If we had sat, if I had sat in my office and come up with those intervention plans, it would have, I would have had one plan for all three sites. I can guarantee you the results were, would not have been that favorable. And I probably would have taken a lot longer to do the study. So I Thank think you. embedding is, is okay. uh, promising. Thank you. Uh, John, briefly before I go to the, well, you've served under presidents of somewhat different hues on this subject. Would you care to speculate about how you think the politics of this plays out and perhaps will play out over the next few years? Well, I, I think, uh, no. In the U.S. specifically. <laughs> no, I, I, no, I think you do. I really, really think you do. Um, and he's speaking for himself. Here, here's, a, here's a, uh, I think, an answer you, you were not expecting uh, because you didn't ask this question. Oh, fair enough. No. Um, <laughs> uh, in medicine, I think uh, members of both parties, uh, conservatives, uh, liberals, and so on, recognize the value of medical research. And uh, why? Because they, and every year the appropriations committees appropriate, you know, tens of billions of dollars to NIH um, without really batting an eye. And, uh, and one of the reasons is because um, there is, people understand that investing in medical research produces improvements in human life over time number of uh, deaths from heart disease and stroke have declined, which are two of the three leading killers in the United States, have declined by more than 50% over the past 40 years because we have good treatments for hypertension and statins and uh, high cholesterol and, and so on. Uh, it's, there's been an enormous improvement, and we are not yet there in social policy. Uh, right now, in social policy, you want me to wrap up. Are we, you? Uh, yeah, uh, you yes. Briefly, yeah. Are, okay. are we going to get there? In, in social policy, the <laughs> nope. challenge is that it's mostly promises at this point, and I think we do need more blockbuster findings of randomized trials showing sizable effects on important life outcomes. There are examples of that. Uh, there's some job training programs, sector specific job training programs that have shown very large effects recently. Uh, KIPP charter schools. There are a few mm -hmm. others. We need more of those. All right. So, Thomas, just with apologies, I am going to go out to the audience now, but please feel free to wrap it into... Uh, I'll come to you first with the answers. Okay, who's, who's up? Make, make, make your question short, sharp, and excellent. Yes. <laughs> the gentleman there. Yes. Um, there are several references to what works, which is terrific. And my question is, how do you get... this? It's hopeless to get the superintendent of schools who's a true believer um, to, uh, to submit to what works... How do you get politicians that are overseeing the superintendent to require him 
to meet the standards of what works. Okay. So let's do, take a couple, couple more. So there's a question about, I guess, let's sort of buy in from local leaders, especially. Uh, and I'd add to that kind of vested interest as well. Very often there's vested interest involved here. There's a couple more. Let's just let's take a couple more. Yep, here. And here. I might randomize left and right. Uh, I have two yeah. questions. One is how do you determine the? Can you speak up a little bit? Oh, uh, how do you determine the size of group, like mm. o o optimal size of group, and how do you trade off the costs and uh, the the effects of the experience? And second is, would the size of group will change the result of experiment? Okay, so how big does group need to be? What's the optimal size, and does the size matter? And then, well, it's all on this side anyway at the moment. Anyways, silence over there. So yes, lady here on the front row. And then I'll come to you first, Thomas. Hi. Um, I was wondering, how would you address the uh, structural issues well, in these randomized trials in terms of who, who is to conduct them, uh, whether the uh, commercial enterprises themselves should conduct them? And I know John Ioannidis has you know, spoken on that. And I was wondering what you would uh, recommend uh, and do you recommend uh, some structural uh, uh, proposals Okay, great. Thank you for, uh, for those questions and for keeping them so succinct. So I'll come to you first, Thomas, then maybe to Andrew, John, and Rebecca. So don't feel the need to answer all three, particularly if you think someone else on the panel may have a better crack at it, but kind of what works and how do you get people bought in, such as a school superintendent? What's the optimal size of group and does it matter? And then I've forgotten the third one, but someone will remember it for me. So, Andrew. Uh, I'll only respond to the first one, the buy-in to the results question, right? How do you get people to buy into... You bring into your mic a bit closer. How do you get people to buy into the results? It's very, very, very hard, right? And the key question for us in this panel is, do people buy in more readily because it's a randomized experiment versus some other kind of design? And as far as I know, we don't have an answer to that. We have lots of anecdotes, but no answer to it. Uh, but buy-in is very hard. People have routines, the results of randomized experiments require them to change their routines to bring on something new. And that's never very easy. Not just because of your own beliefs that the old system worked well, but because novelty means change, and change is a source of disruption. So the buy-in issue is something that uh, is part of a generic public policy problem. It's not unique to randomized experiments. Uh, Andrew, I'll ask you about that too and kind of add a bit of a sting, which is that there are always vested interests. The beneficiaries of successful social policy probably don't know who they are yet and are very badly <laughs> organized. The people who might lose out if you find that their program isn't working know exactly who they are and exactly how much money they're getting. So there are strong vested interests. And so what that tends to mean is that rather than evidence-based policy making, we have policy-based evidence making. In other words, I've spent a lot of money on this. You better find me some evidence. Well, you could always find some evidence, poor quality. Mm. So you've got these vested interests, uh, which might include some of the school superintendent. They're facing political pressures. They've got unions. They've got people supplying the schools. So just talk about the, polit the politics of this uh, at that level. So the politics is certainly hard. Uh, we've, we've somehow cracked it in health. No one asked the health minister to resign just because a cancer trial doesn't find that a drug's effective, but that's not true in education and social policy. Uh, two ways in which I find uh, are interesting to deal with this. Uh, one is incoming governments have far more uh, political space to do randomised trials of their predecessors' programs that they haven't stood up and championed. Uh, the other is that uh, if you've got a federal program providing money to states, there's uh, a lot of scope for a, an evaluation set aside, uh, not a, on a flat basis, but on a basis that any state that wants to do high-quality evaluation can serve more people if it agrees to do a rigorous randomised trial. Uh, very quickly on the how big should my sample be, I'd refer you to the Ten Commandments for Conducting a Randomised Trial section, that's the end of the book, uh, that talks about the, uh, the value of uh, power calculators, uh, many of which are available on the, on the internet. Uh, and one of the other interesting developments is that people are thinking about how you can get uh, large samples out of just a small number of clusters. Uh, the most extreme example of this is one randomised trial being conducted uh, by randomising across four cities, uh, but with a large enough population in the cities uh, that you're getting st statistical significance uh, just with, a, with, with a, a mere four clusters. Um, so you can do very interesting things with, uh, with, with, with that sort of approach. Great. Uh, John? Yes, um, I, to address the question about how do you get a congressman to buy in, 
as and if you can't, how do you get a school district superintendent? I think uh, the answer is that if you're waiting for them to be convinced or you're trying to convince them you're relying on suasion, we will be here in 100 years and nothing will have changed. Because most, in my experience, having you know, worked with a lot of policymakers, most really don't care that much about evidence. Or it's not really that they don't care, but they don't uh, prioritize it. They've got a, people pulling them in six different directions, and they don't know exactly how to read the study. And I think something different needs to change. The same thing that happened in medicine needs to happen in social policy, where evidence becomes the mechanism by which funds are allocated. So in 1962, the United States and also the UK started uh, before they, the law was passed. Um, FDA was given the uh, uh, authority that uh, a new drug would be, could be put on the market only if there were two well-conducted randomized trials showing clinically meaningful effects. And it wasn't a con so Congress was gotten, wasn't making decisions about various drugs. It was put up to FDA, and evidence was the, by statute, the selection criterion. There are now some um, uh, similar or analogous uh, efforts that have been enacted into law recently called tiered evidence initiatives in social policy, where a program is enacted. Congress says that the largest grant shall go to programs that have strong evidence, along with the required replication trial, and smaller grants will go toward programs that are more experimental, but also a rigorous evaluation is required. So that uh, evidence building and use of evidence is part of the system, and you're not relying on individual uh, people to somehow, a uh, congressman or whatever, to somehow recognize its value. The home, visit, the home visiting program would be a good example yeah. of that, I think. Rebecca, did you want to pick up on any of those? Um, and then come back out to the audience. Well, let me just, uh, I think I, maybe I can address uh, a uh, the question of the structure of, eva of, evalu uh, of evaluations. Um, I, I, having done this for a very long time, I think one of the things I um, tell my students and, and tell my colleagues is um, evaluation should always be done with program partners or the, the policymakers. If somebody comes in and just wants to take over, you know, do overlay an evaluation on what you're doing, um, they are not spending enough time understanding the, uh, the, the context, um, and this plays also, I think, to getting buy-in. When you get buy-in you, you buy for evaluation results, when they asked relevant questions, when they presented the findings in, in very um, simple language, and they gave enough context and, and s real stories, if you will, so that um, the individuals who are considering the, the policy or practice change can find themselves in those in those findings. So it goes back to a lot to this issue of communication and how we how we design the studies and how we roll them out. On the uh, question of sample size, one of the things I would say is a well I would take a well um, designed randomized control trial with a very small sample over a quasi experimental design study with a large sample any day. That, so that's the you know uh, just something to keep in mind. Second thing is that it, that it's a it is a complicated uh, answer. It depends how large an impact matters. Uh, people usually get this wrong and they focus too much on on the word power. Mm -hmm. you, you, what you want is you, you at the end of the day you want a, a, a good point estimate that's not biased, positive or negative, and you want to know how much confidence you can have in that. Sort of how likely is it that the that the true impact is near that point that you have uh, identified as your point estimate. And as Andrew said, there, there's uh, some good uh, tools online to help you do that. Thank you. Rebecca's a true randomista, I think it would be fair to say, um, based on what you just said. Okay, so to take one or two more just from the audience, make them, again, as good as the last round. Yep. There, and then there, and then we'll come back to you. Hi, this is a question for our author. I'm Stephanie George from the National Institutes of Health. And you mentioned in response to one of the questions about the value of group randomized trials in these clusters. And I just wanted to make the audience and the panel aware that our office, the Office of Disease Prevention, uh, created an online course about the design and analysis of group randomized trials. So that's available as a government resource as we see more and more of these types of clusters and group trials start. So is your question, would people like to visit our oh, excellent... <laughs> you may visit okay, our fine, great, all right, you, you managed it, okay. Um, <laughs> it's been mentioned a lot about how the difference between correlation and causation is obviously like the foundational question of this entire panel, but 
I've been a research assistant for many studies um, that attempt to analyze people's perception of scientific studies themselves, uh, whether or not uh, it confirms their beliefs or uh, denies their beliefs. Mm. And uh, on top of that, whether or not the study is causal, if people mm. can identify a causal study or a correlational study. And what I found is right. they can't. So right. even if randomized That's control right. tiles are, are the gold standard, how do you effectively communicate the implications of the bronze standard to people who aren't well-versed in randomized control trials or scientific, scientifically literate generally? So I guess the question then is who, who, who you're trying to influence, whether it's the policymaker or the consumer and at, and at what level, but I think that'll be a good question to the panel. And was there one, one more hand? Yeah, just do one more there. Apologies, someone else. Without trying to be too much of a smart aleck. Um, oh, is, go ahead. Is, 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 this, is this another case of science advancing one funeral at a time? That's advancing. What, uh, can you just say what you mean by that? Is it just me? Do you, do you, do you all know what he means by that? Is it just me? I, I think you... Sure. But I'm just getting the relevant... The, there's been a great deal of resistance to oh, randomization oh, in the, the academy as, okay. well as, in the po in, sure. as well as in the sure. policy okay. making. Okay, so I'm going to suggest we start with Rebecca and go so that we give Andrew the last word as we're coming to our final moments. And then perhaps if I'll invite you to... Just finish your remarks each. You just say what makes you most hopeful about the prospects for this kind of work going forward and what makes you most fearful about the prospects of this going forward. You don't have to do that, but it would be helpful to do that too. But you have the kind of three questions in front of you. So Rebecca, let's start with you and just go along the panel. Um, on the question of how, how we um, get people to understand the, the difference, um, this is where I think some, some of these evidence review platforms come into play. I also think training evaluators and I think one of the biggest, uh, a and there's a lot of work to be done, I think, with journals. Um, journals favor um, findings that are positive or confirm uh, ex you know, expectations or hopes, whatever you will. So I think, you know, we, we um, it, I, I think that, the, that you've identified a, you know, so, uh, something for the research community to work on uh, more. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure how to answer that. You don't have to answer every question. Yes, everybody okay. has to answer every question. <laughs> uh, do you want to do hopes and fears? Are you hopeful, fearful? You don't oh, have to. I'm an I'm an eternal optimist, yeah. um, and yeah. I, and I just I see um, you know I, there's a long ways to go, but I can tell you that we are doing evalu evaluations much better, much uh, um, differently now than we did um, years ago. We have many more people who are well trained technically. My concern is that, that it's one thing to learn the textbooks on how to do evaluations. It's another thing to learn the art. There's a lot of art mm -hmm. and persuasion that goes into this. So I tell my students that 90% of the time is, it should, needs to be devoted to the hard thinking up front, the relationship building, the working with sites, the putting your ego aside for the, for the, um, the uh, good of the science and the, and the people you're trying to help by mm -hmm. getting good answers that are, us that are usable. And, uh, you know, publication is very far down on my list of um, dreams. Great. John. So in terms of conveying the difference between an observation, non-experimental study, and a, uh, uh, a good experiment, uh, I agree with what Becca said. There needs to be folks in the research community who can help to distinguish and help to validate studies that are stronger. I think public policy schools and other types... There need to be more people in this world that actually read studies for a living. Uh, people who are uh, really exactly like me is mm, now yeah, that I'm thinking about more, it. We need more of you. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it is no, an you, exercise. You're in friendly, in, friendly territory here. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it is an exercise in forensics. Uh, a lot of the limitations of randomized trials that Tom and others have noted are sometimes buried. Uh, even at some of the best journals, science and pediatrics, you look, you know, there's some, it turns out you look in the online appendix and you do the back calculation and oh my goodness, they lost 65% you know, of the control group and 10% of the treatment group. And so there need to be a lot, that skill, being able to read a study and assess whether it's valid, uh, needs to be more common. There need to be more people doing that kind of detail work. In terms of hopes and dreams, um, uh, I think, uh, you know, I think there need to be more positive blockbuster findings replicated across different sites in social policy showing that evidence can actually move the needle on important social problems. 
examples like the Perscolis randomized trial, which MDRC did. It replicated an earlier study, job training for very low skill and low income workers. It showed a 30% increase in earnings, $5,000 per year, sustained over three years, replicated now across two different studies. That's the kind of thing where it, it, it shows people can see the promised land. Okay. You know? <laughs> Thank you. Tom and then Andrew to give us our final word. All social movements require the few case studies that work very well you can talk about. Um, first to the issue of uh, the uh, telling the difference. John has been very careful. He's always talked about good randomized experiments, well-executed randomized experiments. He's never talked about randomized experiments as a category, right? Because the category contains lots of different skills and levels and quality of implementation of randomized experiments. And if you go systematically through all the assumptions you need to say, I believe in this causal inference from any one randomized experiment, at least in my count, there are 26 of them that have to be made in the social science and medicine piece I've just published. So that's a lot of assumptions to trust any one single causal claim. There's assumptions about internal validity. There are assumptions about the statistical conclusion validity, right? Whether a statistics have been appropriately used. There are assumptions about the construct validity of a causal agent you're interested in, about the construct validity of the effect you're interested in, and then all kinds of assumptions about external validity. What do these results apply to? Do they extrapolate to contexts different from the ones that have been studied to which I nonetheless want to generalize? If you count up all those assumptions, there are 26 of them to trust any one randomized experiment. Now, in a non-experiment, there'll be more than 26. <laughs> Tom, can I ask you to bring it to a close relatively yeah. soon? Yeah, okay, so that. As for the issue of uh, optimistic or pessimistic about the future, I'm never optimistic or pessimistic. I'm always contingently <laughs> pessimistic or op optimistic. Right. Andrew, last word to you. Uh, well, as a uh, Gaul visiting Rome at the height of the empire, um, can I say what a delight it is to be part of the conversation and to, to thank uh, uh, Richard and Rebecca and John and Tom and, and all of you for, uh, for a really stimulating and, and honestly flattering conversation. Uh, everyone who's uh, in the market should uh, clearly do Stephanie's uh, odd course uh, in order to, uh, to learn about uh, group RCTs. Uh, and to, to answer the one funeral at a time question, I suppose I'm reminded of the example that Atul Gawanda gives of uh, uh, the extent to which high quality evidence permeated across medicine on anaesthetics compared to hand washing. Uh, anaesthetics came in, uh, they were immediately a benefit to the surgeons because you didn't have to operate on a patient who was screaming and they were immediately adopted. Uh, hand washing, particularly with chlorine, was painful and took basically a century to be adopted by surgeons. Uh, so we should acknowledge that uh, some advances will, uh, will be adopted quicker than others. Uh, but my cause for optimism is just that I see so many interesting stories out there. Uh, as an economist, I naturally deal in statistics, uh, but I think uh, most people are persuaded by stories far more than numbers. Um, to the extent that we can tell stories about the way in which we cracked scurvy, and indeed that's part of the reason I'm speaking English to you now, because frankly it's pretty hard to get to Australia unless you've dealt with scurvy. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it, it's, it's one of the ways in which we ma managed to tackle polio, one of the ways in which we managed to to address poverty in developing countries through conditional cash transfer. Yes, we've got to get the stats absolutely right, but we've also got to be compelling storytellers about when randomised trials uh, show us positive results and when they surprise us and overturn our conventional wisdom. Um, thank you very much for being part of the conversation, and I very much look forward to signing your book outside. So let me just add to that. that um, thank you. The, the book is available for sale outside at a discount of 20%, I believe, without having to look at a single Amazon pixel. We can, we can now release the 80 control group members who are trapped in the room next door and measure their life satisfaction against yours. Uh, please join me in thanking our panel who are on a mission to make randomization sexy. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.